Tim Mai here with you. This is electromagnetism, lesson number two, part A, and we're looking at electromagnets. So let's get into electromagnets. So magnetism and electricity are all very closely related, and it is that magnetic field that relates them together. Most of the electricity we generate relies upon this relationship between electricity and magnetism. As do motors, the other way around, we use electricity to create magnetic fields to turn motors around. And in many, many, many other electrical components, we're turning mechanical energy into electrical energy, or we're turning electrical energy into mechanical energy. So in this lesson, we're going to explain electromagnets and a number of the terms and equations that relate to them, some of the jargon around electromagnetism. So if you're following along in the textbook, which is Electrical Principles by Phillips, then this is chapter 11 and section two, magnetic effect of an electric current. So here's our first little diagram. And uh, let me just turn on my pen and obviously we've got a battery here providing a DC direct current from plus and we're using conventional current flow so therefore the current external to the battery is flowing from the positive terminal through and back to the negative terminal we've stuck a lamp in series in the circuit A to limit the current and B to demonstrate that there is actually current flowing. But the important thing we want to be able to demonstrate is that there is also a magnetic field that surrounds the wire. So that's what we're demonstrating here with these little dotted lines, little, what we would call concentric donut shaped lines that are in here. The magnetic field, of course, being the strongest, therefore you would have more donuts in close. And we would have less donuts of magnetic field out here a little bit wider. But the important aspect that we need to understand is A, there is a magnetic field. B, that magnetic field strong near the wire. It gets weaker as it gets further away from the wire. And believe it or not, that magnetic field has a direction. And if we were to place magnets, sorry, not magnets, compasses, Inside the magnetic field, all the north arrows would point in one direction and obviously the south would point in the opposite. So in this particular case, we say this field is going in this direction here. So remember, magnetic fields don't rotate, they don't move. But from a north-south perspective, we will put arrows to indicate this is the direction of the field. So an electric current causes a magnetic field to be created around the conductor. And it's all the way around the conductor. So it's like a cylinder that follows the conductor wherever it goes. So direction of the field. So here we're looking at a conductor either flowing away from us or to us. So let's go to the left hand side first. I'll just turn my little pen on. So this cross means that we're looking at the back of the arrow. So we're looking at this direction. So the current is flowing away from us. So U are the point of reference and the current is flowing away. Therefore, it's like looking at the X on the back of the arrow, the back of the arrow like that. And if we look at the back of the arrow, then our field is rotating in a clockwise direction. And we'll look at a nice simple way of being able to remember that. So we've got this magnetic field and it's cylinder-like in shape. Lots and lots of magnetic field down here. And the magnetic field is getting less and less and less as it expands around the wires in a 
cylinder type shape. Let's move over to the other side. Now our point of view is looking with the arrow coming at us. So again, we use this shape, a circle with a dot, because it's like the arrow point pointing at us. So the flights of our arrow can't be seen. They're out the back here. I could put them in, in dotted lines, I suppose, to indicate that the arrow is coming at us. If that's the case, then the magnetic field is rotating in a clockwise direction. You can see that with the arrows in this direction. And again, the magnetic field is at its strongest in close, and it gets weaker and weaker and weaker as it moves further and further out from the conductor. So the important thing to remember from this little explanation here is that the direction of a magnetic field is directly relatable to the direction of the current. So direction of the magnetic field depends, is directly related to, depends on the direction of the electrical current. And when we're generating, the converse applies, of course, that the direction of the magnetic field will determine the direction of the current flowing in a conductor when it's a generator. So in this particular case, we're using electricity to produce a magnetic field, and that magnetic field can either be flowing away from us, as represented on the left-hand side, and we can see the flights at the back of the arrow, or it's flowing towards us, and we all we can see is the dot. So here's the little handy rule. It's called the right-hand rule. And simply, if you grab the conductor in your right hand and grip it with your fingers and your thumb laying in a direction down the conductor, then the curve of your fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field and your thumb will point in the direction of the current. So if you know the direction of the current, you can put your hand on the magnetic, on the current in the conductor and you could determine the direction of the magnetic field. Or if you know which way the magnetic field is, you can put your hand on in the direction of the magnetic field and your thumb will tell you the direction of the current. So it can be used to determine current and it can be used to determine the direction of the magnetic field. So the right hand thumb or grip rule is to find the direction of a magnetic field around a conductor and also the direction of the current if you know the direction of the field. Now to the physics. Magnetic fields around two conductors. This is what this lesson really is all about. We've introduced you to what is the magnetic field and how it's created by current flowing in a conductor. But what happens when two conductors are set parallel and adjacent to each other and they're both producing a magnetic field? So the first is that if they are both flowing away from us or both flowing to us, it doesn't matter because it's the same thing just from slightly different perspective, then as the arrows indicate, the magnetic fields are going to want to join up. That's what's going to happen. You'll see here, the magnetic field wants to come across. It wants to join up through here, continue on, and come back again. The effect is that magnetic forces want to push the two conductors together. So that's what the magnetic forces of attraction will ha happen. So current flowing into the page, both conductors, we get an attraction force. And on the right hand side, if both of the conductors are flowing towards us rather than away, it's just the same field looked at from a different perspective. And you can see again, the magnetic fields want to combine. That's what actually makes the attraction. The two magnetic fields want to line up. They want to be joined together. Therefore, again, we get this force of attraction. You can see our arrows saying, OK, let's get our fields as close as we can. And can we join them together? So when the current is in the same direction to adjacent conductors, then they are 
attracted to each other is the physics that we need to understand from this particular slide. So here I've got a nice three-dimensional drawing to show you what those fields look like in 3D. So again, we've got two currents, both in the same direction. And again, the magnetic fields here will want to flow across and into each other. So this is the kind of effect that we would get with these magnetic fields. They're going to want to join up with each other. So if I grab this third one down here, it's going to want to join into the third one here. That line of force is going to want to join up to the third line of force here. So there you can see they're going to want to join up with each other. So we get this nice connection across the fields. The current is both carrying in the same direction. You can see the currents here, both in the same direction. Therefore, we get this force of attraction. They're going to want to pull each other together because there's this concentric magnetic field built around each of the conductors. But what happens when currents are in the opposite direction to each other? So you can see here we've got one current coming out of the page towards us. So here we've got current coming towards us. I'll just colour the dot of the arrow in pur purple. So there it coming towards us. This one, the current is going away from us. So here we have magnetic field, another magnetic field. But as you can see, these two magnetic fields, as they come towards each other, have got arrows in the opposite direction. So they're going to want to push each other away. That's what's going to happen. So the fields are opposite to each other and you're going to get this form of repulsion. They propel each other away rather than attract. They actually drive each other away in the opposite direction. So they're both doing an amount of pushing in the opposite direction. So currents that flow in the opposite direction to each other simply repel each other. It's the op obviously it's the opposite to them both going in the same direction. And again, I thought it would be handy just to look at, at it in uh, in a two dimensional slash three dimensional picture. And again, you can see I've got a magnetic flux, and if I was to draw it coming out this way, and this one coming out this way you would see that they are opposite to each other. So in actual fact, rather than hit each other, they actually deflect from each other and push each other away. So it actually ends up bending it away. And we get this repulsive action of wanting to push away because these concentric lines of force or flux are simply, I'll go back again, pushing each other away. And on this drawing, you can also see that it's not single dimension. It's actually all happening in three dimensions. And you can see here, here's the, the flux around the wire or the current that's creating that flux is creating this shape. So I've got an electron flow. So it's also creating this flux that is all the way around all the way around. So on both sides we end up with a cylinder of flux and the two cylinders 
simply want to push each other away because the currents are flowing in opposite directions therefore we get magnetic fields in opposite directions. So we can do a little bit of mathematics to describe that and we can say the force between the con two conductors is F equals 2 times 10 to the minus 7 I1 times I2 divided by the distance between them. Now the 2 times 10 to the minus 7 is just a constant to allow us to put uh, everything into F or into Newtons so that uh, we end up with a number that makes sense. So force is in Newtons per meter length. So our distance is in meters, so we end up with in a force of Newtons in Newton meters. So Newtons per meter length. I1 is simply the current in one of the conductors. I2 is the current in the second conductor. And D is the distance between the conductors in meters. So just don't get tricked up there that it's actually got to be in meters. Current is in amps and distance is in full meters. Quite often they'll give you the distance in millimeters and you've got to make sure you put it into meters. So best way to uh, look at something like this is to use an example. So here we've got two currents and we've got a thing called fault current. So obviously a short circuit or something has occurred or a fault of some kind has occurred and we've got 1500 amps or what's called 15 Ka. So here we've got 15 times 10 to the 3 or 15 Ka amps. So quite often we would actually represent that as 15 Ka. And it's a typical type of what we would call a fault level. So if that fault level was to occur and we got 15,000 amps, if it was flowing for a few seconds, a lot of force would be applied. Our distance is 25 millimetres between the conductors. So we've got to convert that into metres and we simply move the decimal place three places to the left to turn it into millimetres into metres and we get 0.025. So we simply substitute our values into our formula F equals 2 times 10 to the minus 7 multiplied by I1 multiplied by I2 and divided by the distance. So in this particular case, we've got our constant of 2 times 10 to the minus 7 to turn the number into Newton meters. And we've got 15,000, you can see there, multiplied by another 15,000. And we're done. So... That ends up being 0.2 times 15 times 15. On my calculator, I was able to just punch in 2 times 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the 15 times 10 to the 3. Another 15 times 10 to the 3. Most calculators can cope with that. In this example here, they've simplified the exponentials or the exponents here. So if I, you know, when you're multiplying, you can subtract the exp exponentials. So here, my minus 7 minus th 3 is just to like to add 3, so that comes down to minus 1, which moved the decimal point on the point 2, because this was t would have ended up with 2, and we just made it go there. It takes care of it, instead of saying times 10 to the minus 1, we simply made it 0 0.2. Same thing. So we could say, 0.2 times 15 times 15 divided by 0.2. Punch that into your calculator and you will get 1800 Newton meters, Newtons in actual fact per meter length. So you could have gone per meter. So you could have just said 1800 Newtons per meter is the force that would be applied. So that brings us to the end of electromagnetism, lesson number two, part A. Hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about electromagnetism 
as it passes through a conductor.